Um, professor, uh, yes. In the meantime, sure. Um, for for lab five, right? I mm -hmm. I, I feel a little bit silly asking for the. Uh, it's it's part one of the lab for lab five, right? It's asking uh, for the initial NaOH Barrett reading and and mm -hmm. the final NaOH Barrett reading. Right. Um, I I got confused by whether or not we should record the number that was at say the uh, where the I think it was the meniscus. Right. Mm -hmm. Do we do we write that down, or do we write technically how much of the NOH that we added into the barrette, which would be technically fifty milliliters? No. So, so this is your burette, right? Right. So you fill it up, and then here's the top of it, and it's got a meniscus on it. So it doesn't really matter uh, what the volume that you pour in. Mm -hmm. It could be it could be any number. The important thing is that you measure what that volume is. So let's say you have a look and you look at the, the meniscus and it's at 41.80 mils. So that would be your initial, that'd be your initial volume. Right. Actually, no, it wouldn't. No, no, here, let me, blah, blah, blah. For mine, it was a really small number. I had right. That's what that's what I was going to change. Yeah. So it start because it starts at a low number and goes to a high number. So yeah. So it's one one point eight zero uh, mils. So then, after you've added, you open up the you open up the bottom and let the drops come out, and then it goes to a second. And when your reaction's over, you have a second volume, and the meniscus is now down here. And so you measure, so this is your volume initial. And then you measure that volume. Let's say it's 23.45 mils. And that's your second or, your, or final, volume final. So the total volume of, of liquid you used is volume final minus volume initial. So it'd be 23.45 minus 1.80. That would be how much you actually use. So you don't care how much you pour in the top at the beginning. The only volume that matters is this difference. Because that's what you could measure accurately. Got it. Got it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people, they're, have that sort of have a sort of issue because yeah I mean they're wondering if I pour in if I pour in 50 mils like if pour in exactly 50 mils how come it's not zero here <laughs> it's like well because there's a dead volume at the bottom so that's why you just pour in a certain amount you don't really care as long as it doesn't go above zero you're good to go uh, pr professor yeah. quick question yes um, it was on lab four, uh, mm -hmm. on filling out one of the, the tables, mm -hmm. it asked volume of milliliter trial one, mm -hmm. A, B, C, and D. Is that how much you pour in yeah. or what's left in a substance? No, it was, a, it was how much you added. So like the, the first trial, it was suggested, you didn't have to follow my suggestion, was that you had 10 microliters of each one. Right, so you put 10 microliters of A, B, C, and D. So 10, 10 microliters of A, of B, of C, of D. Then it asks you what the concent final concentrations would be if no reaction had occurred. And so since each one of them are, is one molar, when you mix them all together, the concentration of each one is now a quarter of what it was originally. Because instead of having 10 microliters, now it's in 40 microliters to so your concentration is dropped by fourfold. So how do I find the, cause there's the volume initial and then the final is the fi final, like the total amount divided by four. Uh, I guess it, so this is the, this is the stoichiometric lab, right? Yeah. Um, it's telling you the volume milliliters, and then it says mm -hmm. initial and final. So in the initial, it had one molar. 
Oh, concentration final. Yeah, so this is the initial. The initial concentration is always one molar because all, all of the stock solutions that you had to add in were all one molar, right? Mm -hmm. So the final concentration would be after the reaction was over, you would expect if nothing happened during that reaction that all your final concentrations or, you know, concentration final of A, B, C, whatever, would be 0 0.25 molar. But you find out that some of them are not, some of them are less. And if the concentration goes down, it's because it was a reactant and it was consumed. And if the concentration went up, it's because it was a product, an additional amount was made. So if nothing happened, if A it was not involved in the reaction in any way, you would expect it to have a final concentration of 0.25 molar. And if that's what it was when the reaction was over, then A is not involved in your reaction. So um, it, the final number, is that the, um, the molar number that I'm putting in that's given after I put the 10 milliliters? No, it's after you sort of, you click on the beaker and it tells you what the final concentrations of everything is. And it tells that's you- That's the number you put, right? The molarity number? Yeah, the molarity for, then that would be the final molarity after the reaction is over. Okay. So your last reaction, the one you really, the very last one you're gonna do is basically when you figured out precise, let's say if it was 2A plus 3B, makes C plus 2D, something like that. So your last reaction, you'd have exactly the right amount of A and B. You wouldn't have any C and D in it, just A and B. So there'd be no products at the beginning. So you would add like 20 mils of A and 30 mils of B, because that's the ratio that you need between them. You'd add those together so that at the end, you'd have precisely nothing but products and you have no reactants left over. So your concentrations of A and B at the end would be zero and you'd only have C and D left. That's what you want your last reaction to be. No, no products at the beginning and no reactants at the end. So no products in the beginning and no, reaction, no reactants at right. the end? Have the, the proper ratio of reactants so when they react with each other, they completely consume each other. That means there's nothing in excess. They're both, they're both limiting, basically. They're matched exactly. And you get that from the, from the ratio of the balanced equation. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right, no worries. All right, let's go back to... The original. Here we go. All right, so there's nothing else. I'm going to pick up basically where we left off uh, last night. That's okay. So basically where we got to last night um, was we sort of introduced the concept of the, the Lewis dots, Lewis models of, of atoms, where there's a dot for all of its valence electrons. And basically what we want to do is arrange those atoms so that everyone winds up having eight dots or eight valence electrons, except for things like hydrogen, which only has two. And so um, sometimes we'll have to make single bonds, sometimes we'll have to make double bonds. We'll talk more about double bonds um, tonight. So I sort of want to get into the different um, uh, symbols and structures that, that, that we can make. And then eventually, uh, pretty much halfway through and, and to the end of the chapter, once we've drawn a Lewis structure, uh, we should be able to now predict what kind of molecular shape it's going to take. Because we need to know what the molecular shape of something is before we can say whether it's, what its chemical properties are. We're not going to know whether it's polar or nonpolar unless we know what its uh, shape is. So where did we leave off? Oh, where are my annotations? I wanna do some drawing. Okay.
right, so last night we sort of left off with the idea that sometimes you can have two structures that are each equally likely. Like, like for instance, with ozone, um, when, we, when we added all of the um, electrons, we remember when, what you do with these structures, you draw off the atoms, you put single bonds uh, connecting them, and then you fill in the rest of the, of, of the electrons as, as you see fit. Well, sometimes there's more than one way to write that particular structure. And as we can see here from a structure one and structure two, they're each equally uh, likely. Double bond can be on oxygen A, or the double B bond can be on oxygen C. It's basically, it's the same, it's the same um, structure. But later we sort of find out that the structure is neither one of them. And that's sort of the tricky thing to think about because if it were the case that um, oxygen A to oxygen B was a double bond then we would expect the bond length of A and B to be shorter than the bond length of B to C which is a single bond. Typically single bonds are this long, double bonds are a little shorter and triple bonds are even shorter but that's not the case. The case is actually both those bond lengths are exactly the same and so that gives us the idea of there's a resonance structure that is sort of the average between those two. And then instead of having um, a double bond on one side and a single bond on the other, actually we have sort of what's called a delocalized kind of bonding where those electrons sort of basically move back and forth. So we almost have like a bond and a half. So the number of bonds adds up to be the same. But instead of having two on one side and one on the other, we actually have one and a half bonds on each side. And we call those bond orders. So if a bond order of a single bond is one, the bond order of a double bond is two. And shockingly, the bond order of a triple bond is three. You see, we sort of have one here and one here, and then sort of another one that's shared halfway there and halfway there. So it's sort of like one and a half. And so we would say the bond order is 1.5. And we see that in um, these sort of hybridized um, resonance structures all the time. And, we're, and we're, we'll, we'll draw a, a couple of them tonight and you're gonna draw a bunch of them in recitation. And so you'll see bond orders of like one and a third, one and a quarter. It depends how, uh, how far that these these electrons can go back and forth. So it's just making the same point. Since we can have a double bond on one side or it can be on the other side, basically we just take the total number of shared electrons. And remember, every electron, every bond, I'm sorry, every bond is a pair of electrons, right? So we have an electron here and there, 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 there. So we say that there's six electrons being shared. A total of six electrons are in bonds. But there's only two places where bonding's taking place. That's one, that's the other. So we have six electrons, that's three pairs, two places to put them, so that gives us an average of one and a half. Okay, and we'll, we'll have a lot more um, examples of that. So I think we did, did we did nitrate last night. Shall, shall we just do it again? Just to sort of, everyone sort of remember how it worked? Yes, no, might as well do it again. I'll just show you how, to, how, how it worked. So remember, the, the atom that goes in the middle it's almost always going to have the lower um, electronegativity. And so electronegativity goes down as the atoms get bigger. So if one is lower on the periodic table, it's going to have a lower electronegativity. And if it's to the left, it's going to have a lower electronegativity. So here we have nitrogen and oxygen. They both have high electronegativity, but oxygen slightly higher. And oxygen can only form two bonds. Nitrogen can form three. So that's usually why nitrogen goes in the middle. 
So we count up the total number of valence electrons. Oxygen has six, because it's in group six. I would suggest you always have a periodic table in front of you when you're doing these, because you're constantly gonna have to remember how many valence electrons all these elements have. And if you just have a periodic table in front of you, you won't have to memorize it. But if you do it long enough, it sort of just comes to you. So oxygen is six, and there's three of them, that's 18. Nitrogen has five. We add those together, and we have to remember, and this is key, remember that there's a negative, it's a negative ion. So we add another electron. One thing that we noticed we were doing the recitations this afternoon is that every time you make one of these structures, you generally have an even number of electrons. And the reason for that is, and it should have sort of make sense to us, how many electrons go into an orbital? How about what's the maximum number of electrons that can go into an orbital? Eight. Oh, just one orbital, not a subshell, just one orbital. So the, the orbitals within that subshell. Two. Two, right, it's an even number, right? So, and what basically when we're making, um, we're making a, a molecule, what these um, atoms are attempting to do is fill all of the orbitals because it's a more stable configuration of electrons. And so if we have an even number of electrons to go around, that's probably the best way for these things to happen. So you want to sort of sort of look for that. If there's if if you see an odd number of electrons, there may be something weird going on. But here we have 24 valence electrons. Remember, we're not counting the total electrons, just the valence electrons, the outer shell electrons. So we have a total of 24. So we stick nitrogen in the middle and we put a single bond around to connect each one. So that's a total of six, right? Because each bond has two electrons. So that's six out of the way. So now we have 24 minus six, we have 18 left. So basically we just give six, we go around the outside. That's how you finish putting in the electrons. You put six here and six there and six there. So then you're out, then you're out of electrons. The problem with that. Once you've added all the electrons, what's the next thing you wanna do when you're looking at your, at, at your structure? Students of my class this afternoon will leap together because they mentioned this a bunch of times. So we put all our electrons on and then what do we do? Count the valence electrons. There you go. Excellent. You'll be teaching this course next term. That's exactly right. You wanna check out the valence electrons because um, we don't want a lot of charges. If, you, if, you're, if your structure has way too many charged atoms in it, that's not stable either especially if you have a negative charge next to a positive charge. Let's have a look at this. So we have, oxygen is supposed to have six valence electrons or valleys. And we subtract the total number of valence electrons that it actually has. So how many valence electrons does each one of those oxygens have? If you wonder how to seven. figure out what, seven, that's right. Because the valence electrons are the total number of lone pair electrons that it has by itself. So lone pair electrons plus half of the bonded electrons. Because in each of those bonds, one of those electrons came from oxygen and one of them came from nitrogen. The total number would be eight because it's got it shares the bond, it shares both those electrons, and it has six of its own. So all the oxygens are happy. They all have eight electrons, but they have seven valence electrons. So we take, we subtract seven valence electrons from the number they're supposed to have, and we get minus one, meaning that each of those oxygens has a negative charge. So we've got three negative charges. And let's look at nitrogen. How many valence electrons is nitrogen supposed to have? Nitrogen, how many valence electrons in nitrogen? Five. Five, it's right there, five, it's in group five. Five, so it has five, so nitrogen has five valleys. 
and we subtract how many it actually has. How many, in this particular example here, how many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Three. It has only three, right? Because it's got three bonds and no, long, and no lone pairs. So it gets one electron from every bond and doesn't have any lone pairs. So really it only has three. So nitrogen's kind of sad. So nitrogen has a plus two charge. And so you've got a plus two charge in the middle and minus one charge is all around it. That is not going to be um, very stable. So what happens is that one of these lone pairs, could be that one, doesn't really matter, jumps in and is shared with the nitrogen. So now that oxygen now has six valence electrons because it has two lone pairs for a total of four, and it has two bonds and a valence electron from each one. So now that oxygen is no longer charged. And the nitrogen still being charged because now it has four valence electrons. Now at least it's only one plus rather than two plus. And these other two oxygens are still minus one. Now, unfortunately, that's all we can do because nitrogen has a total of eight electrons from the four bonds it has. So it can't take any more electrons. We will learn tonight that other atoms can, but nitrogen can't. So basically we're stuck with this, with single bond, single bond, double bond, two oxygens with plus, not minus one charges and a nitrogen with a plus one charge for a total of minus one, which is what the, um, what the ion should have. Now here, there's three different, it could look like that, it could look like that, or it could look like that. Each one it is just as likely, okay? We could, so if this is oxygen one, two, three, the double bond could be on any one of them. It doesn't really matter. And so what we actually find is that none of them is really a, a double bond. Because there's four total bonds around nitrogen, and there's three bonding regions that we say that the bond order is four over three. So it's really a bond and a third is the, is the, is the bond order of all of those bonds. Does that make sense to everybody? No, it's a little weird to think of like a bond and a third, like what the hell is that? It's just that these things will transition so quickly with the electron just moving around in circles and around in circles and around in circles that basically the average is what you see. You don't see any one. If you like use like a laser or something to shoot at it to look at the bond angles and the bond lengths, you see the average because they're changing so quickly. You don't see any one of them. You see the average. Is that, is, is that clear to everybody? Hopefully. All right, everyone's head's full. If you have, if you have a question, yeah. It's, uh, oh, and somebody um, keep track on the chat, would they please? If something comes up that I could address, that would be sweet. All right, so we sort of talked about um, valence electrons and how we calculate the charge. This is the actual formula um, we use. So formal charge is the charge an atom would have if everybody shared equally. Okay, and we're going to find out that's not true. But if everything was shared equally, you would count, like I said before, the valence electrons would be the unshared pairs and half of the uh, electrons in a bond. Because, you know, each, each of the electrons in a bond, would be like I say, one came from atom A and the other came from, from atom B. So for the valence of... A here, if it has the double bond, it has four, so it'll be this same as this one here. It has one, two, four electrons that it keeps for itself, and it has one, two bonds. And so it keeps an electron from each one. 
So four plus two is six. So there's two ways you can calculate it. Either you can just calculate the, the just count the number of bonds and divide by two, or just look at the uh, number of bonds and say that it keeps one electron from each one. Either way, it'll get you there. So four plus two is six. So that uh, oxygen has no charge. So that is zero charge. This one has a charge of minus one because it has one, two, three pairs of electrons for a total of six and an electron from the bond. So it has seven valence electrons. So it has a negative charge. And B, so let me clear these out, oxygen B has two electrons it keeps for itself and one, two, three bonds. So it has two unshared electrons plus three bonds from, three electrons from bonds. So it has a total of five. So this oxygen is positively charged. That's inherently unstable. That's why ozone is so, is so reactive because it has a positively charged oxygen, which is really unstable. So it has a, and, and like I said before, um, if you have a negative um, charge next to a positive charge, that's inherently unstable too. And so that's why ozone reacts with, with, with so many different things. All right. So basically, all the resonance forms, formal charges must sum to whatever the, the charge is. So in other words, um, on this, with ozone, there's no charge, no net charge on ozone. But as we showed, one of the oxygens is neutral, one of them is a positive charge, and one of them is a negative charge. So you add all of them together and you get zero. Same like we did with, we just did with the nitrite ion, or nitrate ion, sorry, nitrate ion. We had two negative charges on the oxygens plus a positive charge on the nitrogen. So we had minus two plus one and the total charge was minus one, which is what the charge of the nitrogen is. Or nitrogen, the charge of the, of the, of the, of the overall ion. So when you're making these things, you gotta make sure that all of the, if, you, if you're putting charges in there, make sure that all the charges sum to whatever the total is supposed to be. So if you have, an, if you have phosphate ion, for instance, if you're drawing phosphate ion and you're putting all the structures in there and you're moving the electrons around, when you add them all together, they better add up to minus three because that's what the charge of a phosphate ion is, okay? And so we'll, we will do that a couple times tonight. Again, like I said, when you're drawing these resonance forms, there's a lot of different ones you can choose. Smaller charges, smaller net charges are preferable to big ones. Like for instance, you could draw a structure where you have um, an atom with a plus three charge next to a, an atom with a minus two charge. You could do that, but that's not terribly stable. These electrons are gonna jump from the minus two to the plus three. And so if, if, if your B atom has a whole bunch of extra lone pairs, they're gonna move to the space where there's not much uh, electron um, concentration. So this is not a stable uh, configuration. So, but if you have like a plus one next to a zero or a minus one next to an uncharged one, that's, that's a smaller, formal charge and that's preferable. So you definitely want to avoid like charges on adjacent ions, on adjacent atoms. So if you have like a minus one on one atom, you want to avoid having a minus one on, on the next one as well. And if a negative charge should be on something, it should be on the most electronegative atom. That makes sense. So that's not always going to be the case, but it's usually going to be the case. So if I have uh, nitrogen and it's bound to fluorine and it winds up that there's a negative charge in that bond, that negative charge should be on fluorine, not on nitrogen, because it's extremely unlikely that nitrogen with a lower electronegativity is going to, you know, muscle out fluorine for that extra electron. That ain't happening. 
fluorine is going to pull that. If there's, if there's any electrons to be had, fluorine is going to be taking them. So whoever's the most electronegative, generally fluorine or oxygen, is going to be negatively charged on, on most of these um, ions. That's why, you, that's why there are so many polyatomic ions with oxygen in them, because oxygen is so damn electronegative that it steals electrons from sulfur that gets in the middle for sulfates and sulfites. It steals them from phosphorus. That's why we have phosphates and phosphites, um, because oxygen is really electronegative. And so that's where the negative charges go. So is there a question there? Or someone's head just fell over from being asleep. Okay, I understand. Is that always the case? No. In some instances, um, in some instances, uh, and we'll talk about this in, in a little while, certain, um, certain atoms cannot, like atoms in, in uh, uh, the second um, level, second grade, second family, um, second row of the periodic table, they can't take any more than um, eight electrons in their outermost shell. Whereas um, atoms further down in the third or fourth row um, can take more electrons than eight. And so you'll see in certain situations that a less electronegative um, atom takes more electrons just because it can, and the, the more electronegative one can't. But so that, that sometimes happens, but usually if there's, a, if there's a formal charge to be made, it generally goes to the more electronegative. Not always, um, there's certainly things like carbon monoxide, where carbon actually has a negative charge, which is again, why car carbon monoxide is not terribly good for you, because it's very, very reactive. So certain instances like that, but, the, but they're, they're fairly rare. Good question. All right, so here's cyanate. Speaking of things that aren't good for you, a cyanate ion. So there's three different ways you can draw this, right? So cyanate ion is, has nitrogen bound to carbon bound to oxygen. And it has a overall charge of minus one. So we look at them. So the first, you can draw it that way. When we draw it that way, carbon has no charge. That's good. Um, oxygen is a plus one charge. That seems unlikely because it's, it's very electronegative. And nitrogen has a minus two charge. Well, I mean, that's a lot of, it seems to be a lot of excess charge. And <laughs> nitrogen, very, hey. <laughs> nitrogen very rarely, um, carries a minus two charge. This just usually doesn't happen. So let's look at the second one. So in this instance, carbon again has four bonds and no lone pairs. So carbon's good. Oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs, which is what it usually looks like. That's fine. And nitrogen has two lone pairs and two bonds. So it has six valence electrons. So it's minus one. Well, that is better than the first one because um, there's fewer formal charges, but oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So it makes more sense that the third one is the most likely form where there's no charge on nitrogen, there's no charge on oxygen, and the oxygen has the minus one charge. That makes more sense. So when we consider all three are like, theoretically possible. But when we look, when, when we look at uh, what the average is really going to look like, um, two and three are more likely than one. And three is more likely than two. So if we had to weight the average, most of it's going to look like three, maybe slightly smaller is going to look like two, and hardly any of it's going to look like one. Okay? Because we want the charge to be on the most electronegative um, element. And also, um, when you re remember when we looked, when we looked at the, um, at the, uh, the way 
uh, we put dots around each, each of the um, atoms. We put our Lewis dots in there. Nitrogen almost always has three bonds in a, in a lone pair. That's the most stable configuration for nitrogen. So if you see, if you make a model that has nitrogen with a lone pair and, and three bonds, that's most likely your, your best uh, interpretation of how to, how to make one of these structures. So now we're gonna look at um, what oxidation number actually means. We sort of talked about it a little bit before, um, but oxidation number sort of refers to um, what the charge would be on each one of these atoms if it was in an ionic compound, but it's actually in a, in a covalent uh, compound. So for, look at what the actual formal charge of something would be. We assume that all the bonding electrons are shared equally. So we assume that everybody gets along and that everybody shares their, everyone keeps their, um, their, un their unbound electrons, basically their free pair of electrons. They keep those, their lone pair of electrons, they keep those and they get to keep, when they, when they share electrons with somebody, they get to keep half of them, okay? So we assume that they share them equally, but we realize that in, in just like in real life in chemistry, things aren't fair. So for an oxidation number, we assume that the, elect, the more electronegative atom is just a bully and just jacks those electrons and keeps them, okay? So for oxidation numbers, it would be much higher than, than, than uh, formal charges. Formal charges are gonna be low, like you know, minus two, minus one, plus one, that's, you're not really gonna see much numbers bigger than that. Oxidation numbers, you're gonna see much, much higher numbers. Because for instance, look at carbon. Carbon, formal charge, every time is zero. Because it has four, four, it has four bonds, and we assume that it's sharing them nicely. So it has a total of four valence electrons, which is the number of valence electrons it's supposed to have. On the other hand, Nitrogen on the left and oxygen on the right both have a higher electronegativity than carbon does. So to calculate oxidation numbers, we assume that carbon gets to keep none of its electrons. And so these two, so let me clear this out because it's getting a little. So these two, these four electrons that uh, nitrogen is sharing with carbon, nitrogen keeps all of them. So four electrons go to nitrogen. These four electrons and the two bonds that carbon sharing with oxygen all go to oxygen. So that's four more electrons to oxygen. So you can see that these numbers, so carbon goes from having um, four valence electrons to having none. So its oxidation number goes to plus two. We give all of the um, shared electrons to oxygen. It has six valence electrons. Now it has eight for minus two. And nitrogen has two, four, six, eight um, total electrons. And it should have five valence electrons. So we say it's minus three. And we use oxidation number to sort of keep track uh, during chemical reactions of where the, where the electrons going. Um, we, because basically when a, when, a, when, a, when a reaction takes place, electrons are transferred, right? Electrons are moving from, from one atom to another, they're being shared. We wanna sort of, basically it's a way of keeping track as to um, somebody's getting reduced, which somebody's getting more electrons, and someone's being oxidized, meaning someone ox, um, electrons are being taken away. And Professor? this calculation helps us, yeah. How did you get the number negative three, that, those numbers? Oh, sure, 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 sure. All right, so one more time. Um, so to calculate oxidation number, we assume that the more electronegative element gets all the electrons. It gets to keep the, the, the unpaired, the, the lone pair electrons it already has, and whatever bonds it's forming, um, it keeps those, those electrons, as long as it's with a less electronegative element. The nitrogen, so the electronegativities here go, carbon is the lowest, followed by nitrogen, followed by 
oxygen. Oxygen's the, the highest. So poor carbon's in the middle. So it's sharing four electrons with, um, it's sharing four electrons with nitrogen. Now nitrogen gets to keep all of them. And it's sharing four electrons from these two bonds with oxygen. Now oxygen gets to keep all of them. So poor, poor carbon gets none. It doesn't keep any electrons. And so it has four valence electrons normally. Now it has none. So we say it's, has, its oxidation number is plus four. We take the valence number and we subtract the number of, of um, electrons it actually has. So its oxidation number is plus four. Nitrogen has five valence electrons, right? And then we look and we see how many um, valence electrons does it have now? Well, it's got two, four. So it keeps those, it's got the lone pairs it keeps to itself. It also has four electrons from these two bonds that it was making with carbon. Since it's more electronegative, it keeps all of those four electrons. Now, so it, we subtract the eight electrons it currently has, and that oxidation number is minus three. Okay, so the oxidation number is just, how many valence electrons do you normally have? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we subtract how many you actually get after we are, uh, reward the higher, ox the, the, the higher electronegativity with all of the electrons. It'll make sense when we talk about um, elements reacting with, with oxygen. Basically, oxygen reacts with other elements to take their electrons. And we can keep track of that by the oxidation number. Oxygen's oxidation number will go from zero when it's O2. So oxygen, when it's an O2, its oxidation number is zero because it's sharing a, a, electrons with itself. But then when it reacts with an, pretty much any other element, its oxidation number goes down. It goes to minus two usually, because it takes those electrons from somebody else. That's why they're called oxidation numbers in the first place, because it's, it's oxygen that's usually stealing those electrons. We'll talk more about it. It'll hopefully make a little bit more sense as we go along. So now we're gonna talk about, hey, we had a rule. Well, of course, when there's a rule, there's gonna be exceptions to those rules, right? Um, these are exceptions to the octet rule. What was the octet rule? The octet rule was when we had all of these, um, we were making these um, drawings of these different compounds, we wanted to arrange the atoms in a way that everybody wound up with eight electrons, right? Because eight is the magic number. Everybody wants to get to eight um, electrons in their outermost shell because everyone wants to look like a noble gas. Well, not everybody gets to look like a noble gas. Kind of sad. So one is boron. Oops, let me go back. One is boron and beryllium. A boron and beryllium, boron has three valence electrons. And beryllium has two. And so basically, um, they, they aren't going to be forming, um, they're not going to be making uh, any more bonds than that. Because it only, beryllium only has two valence electrons. It's going to make it one bond there, and it's going to make one bond there, and that's it. Boron has three, so it's going to make three bonds. One, two, three, and not have any lone pairs. So it's only going to have six electrons total because it doesn't have any more electrons to share. So it's sort of stuck that way. Other things, I mentioned before that um, if you have an odd number of electrons, generally molecules want to avoid having unpaired electrons because we call that a radical. An unpaired electron is extremely reactive. And basically what, it, what those molecules will do is going around stripping electrons from basically anything they come in contact with to fill that orbital. So it will fill this one up. It'll put another electron there. And what happens to the, the uh, molecule that had the electron stripped from it? Now it's a radical and it will go around trying to get the electron from somebody else. And the reaction just keeps going and going and going. That's why peroxide is so good at like killing stuff. Because it has a free radical in it and just basically blows apart 
all sorts of, of um, organic molecules in living things. So that's an exception um, to the octet rule. Occasionally, you're going to find um, a radical. Um, that happens when you have an odd number of electrons, right? So we have an odd number of electrons there. So if that happens, um, we're going to have an unpaired electron there, or we're going to have an unpaired electron there. And so there's a lot of pressure to fill that um, orbital with an electron from pretty much anywhere it can get it. Now, the sort of exception that we're going to probably be dealing with the most are atoms that can put more than eight electrons in their outermost shells. Now, these are going to be in period three or higher. Why? We sort of talked about this this afternoon, but I think it makes the point rather well. That in period two, n equals two, right? Our first quantum number, our shell number is two. So how many subshells do we have when n equals two? Two. Two, right. So what are they? 2s and 2p. 2s and 2p, exactly. And 2s has one place to put electrons, and 2p has three places to put electrons. So the maximum number of electrons that um, an element in period two can put in its outermost shell is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, that's it. There's no more room. There's no more room to put any more electrons. But if n equals three, how many, so if, if I'm in the third shell, how many different subshells can I get? Ten electrons total. How many subshells, though? It's more than ten. Three. There's three, right? Eighteen. So what? So what are they? There's three S, three P, and what's the third one? Roger, could you grab Jerome? So we have three S, three P, and what's the third one? Three D. Three D. That's right. So S has room for two electrons. P has room for six. And how many does D have room for? Do you remember? Ten. Ten, that's right. So in the outermost shell of period three or bigger, it has room for 2 plus 6 plus 10. It has room for 18 electrons. And so basically, what you will find is that um, phosphorus, for instance, phosphorus has five valence electrons. And a lot of the time, it will make five bonds with those five valence electrons. And so when it makes five bonds, it fills the d orbital completely. That's completely filled now. And when you have a completely filled high energy orbital, that's very stabilizing. On the other hand, how many valence electrons does sulfur have? Sulfur is just below oxygen. So how many valence electrons does oxygen have? What group is sulfur in? You really got to have a periodic table in front of you. I got mine in front of me. Six. Six, that's right. Yeah, I don't expect me to remember this stuff, do you? Hell no, I'm old and stupid. No, I got I to look at a periodic table. It has six, right, it has six valence electrons. So it will make six bonds. And when it makes six bonds, look what happens. It fills up D with 10 and S with two more for a total of 12. And so you have a completely filled D orbital, 10, and a filled S orbital, 2. And so it's stable. But it's making six bonds, which is fine because it can. Um, elements in, in period 2, like nitrogen and carbon and oxygen and fluorine, can't do that. 
they only have room for eight. So they follow the octet rule. But bigger atoms, like especially atoms like phosphorus and silicon and uh, selenium and sulfur, they have bigger outer shells. They can put a lot more electrons in them. And so what they try and do is basically keep the number of uh, valence electrons the same. So phosphorus will still have five and sulfur will still have six, but they'll make a lot more bonds. They'll make five or six uh, bonds in order to do that. So look for that uh, when, we, when we make uh, more of these structures. Let's do a couple. Um, let's do A and B. Actually, B you're probably going to be doing in, in, um, in recitation tonight. Let's do A. You may be wondering, how the hell could you do A? But xenon is making a, it's actually making a uh, product. You can make a compound that is xenon, even though it's a, it's a noble gas. If these, these things have been known for a little while now. That, and it, but it, what it does is it takes something super electronegative to steal an electron away from a noble gas. And that's why we generally only see um, molecules with fluorines um, for xenon uh, and krypton and argon, mostly with xenon though. All right, let's, let's try, let's, let's make one of those. Let's do xenon. Ah, damn it, it's already shown here. <laughs> I, th I thought I'd, I'd figured it out. Anyway, let's just go over how it's done. So, we do it the same way we do anything else. Xenon has eight valence electrons, right? And how many does fluorine have? So, Xenon seven. has seven, so it's four times seven. So four times seven is 28 plus eight, 36. So we put our xenon in the middle and we do our one, two, three, four bonds, right? So that takes away eight, so minus eight. So we have 24 left over. So, not 24, what the hell am I saying? 28, <laughs> 28 left over. So we go around the outside and we put six on each fluorine for a total of 24. That leaves us with four left over. And whenever you have um, electrons left over, they go to the middle because everybody on the outside now has sufficient number of electrons. So we put the four left over in the middle. So when we look at this, we calculate the charges. So how many, what's the charge on fluorine? Fluorine, how many valence electrons should fluorine have? We just answered that question. How many valence electrons on fluorine? Seven. Seven, right. Seven valleys. So and how many valence electrons does it have in this particular picture? Seven. It has also a seven, two, four, six, and one of these. So minus seven equals zero. How many valence electrons does xenon have? Eight. It has eight. And we look, it has two, four, and then one from here, one from there, one from there, one from there, for a total of eight. So nobody has a charge, everybody's happy. That is is an actual um, compound you can make um, in a lab, okay? But it needs, how many total electrons does xenon have here? If you counted the total number of electrons xenon had, not just the valence, how many total electrons does xenon have? 12. Yeah, that is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. But that's fine because xenon is a big is a big atom and it has an ex, it's an expanded um, outer uh, shell which will have s, p, and d present in it. So it has a room for eighteen electrons. So holding twelve is not a problem. Uh, 
Yeah, I think I'll do. Yeah, we'll do phosphate during the the, the recitation, or we can go over it um, tomorrow. And boron. You remember? So how many um, valence electrons does? Oh, which one goes in the middle? First of all, boron. Drawing it. Boron's got to right. There's no way it's going to have a higher electronegativity than either fluorine or chlorine. So we put boron. Oops. Boron in the middle. And put fluorine there, chlorine there, chlorine here. One, two, three. So uh, valence electrons for boron. Three. Three. And valence electrons for chlorine and fluorine. Seven. Seven. So three times seven, 21. So 24 total. And how many electrons are in bonds? Six. Six. We've already used up six. And if you ever wonder where those are, just one, two, three, four, five, six. Because every bond is two shared electrons. So we're left with 24 minus six. So we have 18, right? 18 left over. So for our 18, go around the outside. So one, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and now I'm out. There's none left over, so I don't have to put anything in the middle. So when we look at this particular structure, I think we're done because um, the fluorine doesn't have a charge because it has seven valence electrons. There's the seven valence electrons for fluorine, so it's good. There's the seven valence electrons for chlorine, it's good. There's the seven valence electrons for the other chlorine, it's good. And boron has three valence electrons. One, two, three. So it's good. And you're done. So there's only three bonds going in the middle rather than, there's only three electrons in the middle rather than, than more than that. Yeah, it looks just, just like we thought. So it's electron, boron is electron deficient, meaning it's not going to have an octet in the middle. It's only going to have six total electrons. Now, we're going to take this information and use it in order to make um, some predictions of what these molecules are going to look like. It's really, that's the important thing. Just drawing stick figures is not really going to get us anywhere if that information doesn't lead to something else. And so what it leads us to is how these molecules are actually shaped. So we're going to take the leap from the, what it looks like uh, as a stick drawing on a page and what it actually looks like in nature. And there's a theory we're going to use in order to figure out what these um, um, shapes are going to look like. It's called Vesper, which you know, sounds all it Vesper means. So it's valence shell electron pair repulsion. Ooh, it sounds fancy. All it is is that electrons don't like each other theory. That's it. Because valence shell electrons, electrons that are being shared with other atoms, and free electrons, the un, uh, lone pair electrons, don't like to be in the same space and they repel each other. That's really all it is. And so if I have a, let's say I have nitrogen here and it's got a lone pair, and it's also making a bond with hydrogen. What that is is really another pair of electrons, right? I have a pair of electrons here. I have a pair of electrons there. They're both negatively charged. They are going to try and move away from each other as far apart as they can in order to reduce the amount of repulsion that same charge electrons have. They're all negatively charged. They're all going to want to move away from each other. And that's all this means. So basically, when you think about it, if I have, um, if I have atom A, this has a bond with B and a bond with C. So what is the structure of this that gives me the maximum distance away from C and B? What shape would that take? Straight line. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and we will see that if we have um, 
something with two regions of electron density. And that's what we have here. This is a bond. That's a region of electron density. This is a bond. That's a region of defense electron um, density. If I got two of them, it's going to be linear. And that kind of makes sense. What if I have three? What if I have A in the middle and I got B and B and B? And they each make a bond. Now, what structure is that going to take to get the Bs as far apart from each other as possible? Is that a trigonal planar? Yeah. It's going to be a triangle. It's going to look, each one is going to look like a triangle. Because in that situation, each one of the Bs is as far away from each other as it can possibly get. And so if there's three regions of electron density, it's going to be a triangle. That makes sense too. And that's really all Vesper is saying, is that lone pairs and bonded electrons are going to push each other away. And that's it. And then we'll just look and see, um, depending on how many um, areas of electron density there are, when you, when you draw your, your, your compound, that will predict um, what shape your, your, your molecule is going to be. And then once we know what shape the molecule is going to be, then we can predict what kind of polarity it has. Because when we talked about earlier, um, for a molecule to be polar, it's two things, right? needs to have a polar bond, well, duh, and it can't be symmetrical. So if we know the shape of it, we can determine whether or not it's going to be symmetrical or not. If we don't know what the shape's going to be, there's really no way to know whether, whether it's going to be symmetrical. We don't know what the shape is first. But if we figure out what the shape is and then add to that where the, where the polarity is, then we can tell you whether or not it's going to be a polar bond. Uh, I'm sorry, a polar molecule. So each group of valence electrons pushes each other away, just like I said, that's all it is, just to minimize um, repulsions, okay? And a group is any number of electrons. So a single bond with electron, two electrons, that's a group. A double bond, That's a group because it's between two atoms. So I have my atom A and atom B, atom A and atom B. Basically, if it's in the same relative space, it's considered a group. So even if I have a triple bond between A and B, it's all in the same space between A and B. And so that's also a group. Although you can imagine that the electron density is highest here and then there and then there. So a double bond may exert a little bit more repulsive force than a single bond does. And a triple bond will have even more repulsive force um, than a double. And that's also true. What's also true is that a lone pair has more repulsive force than a single bond. And the reason for that is at the end of this single bond are atoms. And atoms have um, nuclei, and nuclei have protons in them, and so you tend it tends to dissipate the the the, the full effect of, of of the charge. If you have just a lone pair of electrons with nothing else around them, they tend to repel um, other bonded atoms away from it. And we'll see how that, that affects some of the, some of the uh, angles in a little while. So here's what the different shapes, what the sort of general shapes are. So just like we predicted, um, if I only got two electron groups, they're going to move far away from each other, they're going to form a line. Makes sense. If I got three, they're going to form themselves into a triangle. Get a different color. Yeah, they're going to form a triangle. That makes sense. If they have four regions, like that's a tetrahedral shape or like a pyramid uh, shape. If there's five, basically it's sort of, sort of like a double pyramid, like one on top, 
one on the bottom. So we have one, two, three, four, five. So two are basically linear, as far away from each other as they can, and the other three are at a triangle, going around, getting as far away from each other as they can. When there's six, basically you form like an octahedron where everything's at a 90 degree angle. That gives, the 90 degree angle gets everyone as far apart from each other as they possibly can. Because if you twist any one of those angles, basically you shift now some of those electrons closer to somebody and they go back. So 90 is, is the precise angle where the least amount of interference takes place, where the least amount of repulsion takes place. So how do we decide which one of these is gonna be? And we use this formula right here, pretty straightforward. Oh, let me go back. Pretty straightforward formula. A is going to be your central atom or the axis. That's another way of thinking about it. It's the axis of the molecule that around everything spins around. So we say what shape is it going to be? We take A, central atom, X, how many atoms does it have around it? And we just count them one, two, three, four, how many? And then E, how many lone pairs of electrons does it have? So for instance, something like methane. So A is carbon, that's the central atom, because it looks like this. One, two, three, four. So what would X be in this situation? So A is the central atom, it's carbon. How many surrounding atoms around carbon? Four. 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 And how many lone pairs does carbon have? None. None. So we would look up, and this is where, if you don't need to memorize this, you just go back and look up. What's AX4? And you go back, and we'll see, we'll see, actually we'll see that in a minute. AX4 basically means the tetrahedral, means this. It'll have this shape. That's what it'll look like. That's why um, uh, methane has a tetrahedral shape and all the bond angles are exactly 109.5 degrees because that gives it the maximum distance between all the, all the hydrogens. So the angles, a bond angle is the angle formed by the atoms. So here, in this instance, let's say we have, this was bromine trifluoride. These bond angles would be the angle between one fluorine, the middle atom, which is uh, boron, and the adjacent fluorine. So this angle here. And in this instance, they'd all be the same because it forms a triangle that all be 120 degrees. That all be exactly the same. It's just 360 degrees in a circle. You divide it by three, 120. So each one of those bond angles would be 120. But it's not always going to be exactly um, the predicted bond angle because, as we sort of you know mentioned a little earlier, um, lone pair of electrons are going to push other atoms a little bit further away from itself. Double bonds have more electron density. They're gonna push um, other atoms a little further away from itself. So here we can sort of see that here. If we have, so here we have three electron regions. Here we have three electron regions. Here we have three electron regions. And here we have three electron regions. They all should have the same shape because they all have three electron regions. But, those three electron regions aren't identical. If they're identical, then you get exactly 120 degree angles. But if they're not, so here, they're all the same. So that would be exactly 120 degrees. This is a double bond. It makes a double bond with Y. So it actually 
pushes these two X's away from it a little more. This will be greater than 120 degrees, and this angle will be less than 120. Here, we've got a lone pair of electrons. It also tends to push X, these two X's together a little bit more. This angle is usually less than 120 degrees. And this angle, we don't really know what it's gonna be unless we know what the identity of, of Z is. If it's a huge atom, it will you know, push things away a little bit more. And if it's a tiny one, it won't. So any questions of how we calculate bond angles or what the, what the bond angle actually is? You need three atoms to make an angle, right? So that's how we calculate them. How significant can these um, deviations be? Oh, they can be as they can be as big as like ten degrees in some instances, and we can measure these like um, experimentally. We can measure these bond angles to extremely accurate. Like, you know, we can measure them down to like, you know, a hundredth of a degree. So you can, you can see the effect of changing uh, these atoms a lot. It makes a, it makes a fairly big difference. But I think the biggest deviation I've seen is around 10, like maybe 10, 12 degrees. It's usually somewhat more subtle than that, but I think that's the biggest one I've seen. Of course, I haven't seen everything, have I? So... All right, let's just have a look at some of these shapes, then you guys will go on and build these beautiful things. So pretty, uh, makes sense that if you have just two places to put electrons, they're gonna be far apart from each other. So linear, pretty easy to, to think about. This is why um, carbon dioxide is linear. We go like this. Now, how, how many um, electron uh, dense regions are there around the carbon? Remember, I'm not talking about the oxygen, I'm talking about the carbon. How many electron regions around the carbon? Two. Two, yeah, there's a double bond on this side for one, and there's a double bond on that side for two. Two, so because it has two, two, two um, uh, regions of electron density, they're gonna move as far apart from each other as they possibly can to avoid repelling each other. And the, the greatest distance you can get away with, with if you only have two places to go is opposite directions, right? And so opposite directions. That's why um, car uh, carbon dioxide is a completely linear molecule. And it explains why it's also nonpolar. Because since it's linear, it has its, its uh, bond dipoles pointed in exactly opposite directions. Pointing in that direction, pointing in that direction. They're pointing in exactly opposite directions, and those bond dipoles are exactly the same size, meaning it's completely symmetrical. And if a molecule is completely symmetrical, it is nonpolar. That is the law. So using this uh, rule, we can see why that's the case. Now, when there's three, um, we get this uh, particular. We either we get a, a, a plane, we get a trigonal planar, which is called, which is just basically, yeah, it's a fancy word for it, it's a triangle. It's a two-dimensional triangle. And that's with the 120 degrees in, in, in between them. Now, what people forget is they forget the lone pairs. So for something like, um, well, like we just did ozone, um, for instance. So we had ozone look like this, right? We had, could be a double bond on one side and a single bond on the other. But this um, oxygen in the middle had a lone pair. So how many 
electron groups does that oxygen in the middle? And remember, we only, when we're talking about um, the electron group arrangement, we're only talking about the atom in the middle. We are not talking about the atoms on the, on the outside, only the middle. And so this is the oxygen we're talking about. How many electron groups are around that oxygen? Three. Three. What are they? So one of them is the single bond. What's the, what are the other two? There's one. Double bond and lone electron. That's right. So that's a single bond. That's a group. That's an electron group. That's a double bond. That's another electron group. That's the lone pair. That's another electron group. So even when you, so when you draw that particular um, arrangement, you don't really see like if you took a picture of it, like an x-ray or something, you wouldn't see this because electrons are really, really small, but it's the electrons that are making it bent because um, it should be linear, right? I have three, it should look like that, but it doesn't because I got the lone pair up here and that pushes them away, that pushes them down. And, and we'll see the same is true when we look at water. So here, again, we have AX, oops, let me go back. We have AX3, no lone pairs. This is AX2E. So there's two atoms around it and one lone pair. But both of them have three regions of electron density, okay? And this just makes this, oh, that's a much bigger difference than, than, uh, than uh, 15 degrees. There you go right there. That makes a much bigger difference. So um, these are some of the things affecting uh, bond angles, as I mentioned before. Lone pairs repel tremendously. Double bonds also uh, repel tremendously. And so you will see big differences away from the predicted ideal uh, bond angle. Here, we would have predicted the ideal bond angle to be 120, and you can see it's actually only 95 degrees. That's a huge, huge difference. So now we go to four electron groups. We have a lot of, a lot of elements in the uh, fourth electron group. So here is water. So you don't expect water to have um, to be bent. This is the reason why water is polar. It's why it's bent because there's oxygen in the middle. There's one hydrogen. There's the other hydrogen, and these are the two lone pairs that oxygen keeps for itself. And it's those two lone pairs of of electrons which bend. The, the hydrogens toward each other and makes it a polar molecule. Because if it wasn't, we just have this. And it would not be polar, then it would be non-polar. But because of those lone pairs, it's bent, it's polar, we have oceans, everything's good. So that would be called A, central atom, that would be oxygen. It's got two atoms around it, the two hydrogens, that's two, and two lone pairs, E2. So basically you just, you count up the number of X's and E's, and that tells you what group you're in. Two, three, four, five, six. Gives you the indication of what shape. Now, even though these are different shapes, we say they're all in the same family, because basically here, this would be what, what we, um, methane looks like, CH4. We say that that's tetrahedral. This is what ammonia looks like. We talked about ammonia a little bit in, in uh, recitation today. So ammonia, um, nitrogen likes to have one, two, three bonds and a lone pair. It almost always takes that, that particular um, way of bonding. 
it gives it the same shape. It gives it, it still has four electron regions, but we call this one trigonal pyramidal because basically we refer to the shape as between the atoms, not the shape of the electron, of the free electrons. Because when you look at the molecule, basically you don't see the electrons. You see the effect the electrons have, but you don't really see them because the electrons are super, super itty bitty. But you, can, you, you see the atoms. And so even though these are different shapes, trigonal, pyramidal, and tetrahedral, they're in the same family because there's four regions of, of charge. So don't get hung up on you know, trying to remember the names because you'll be able to, to, to look at these. You'll have this available when you take tests and stuff like that. What I want the sort of the take home lesson to sink in is what an electron group is what an electron group is and how that's going to affect shape. Okay. So tetrahedral, trigonal, pyramidal, and bent, all the same shape, really, even though when you look at the atoms, they kind of look different. Then it gets pretty freaky when we start getting up to five and six. So with five, basically we have that linear arrangement. We have a linear arrangement going up and down, and then basically a triangle around it. So we have one, two, three, four, five places to, to put um, electrons. So if we call these axial, which kind of makes sense because they're like the axis of the Earth are on top and in the bottom. And just like the Earth, these three are around the equator. So we call these axial atoms on top and bottom and equatorial atoms going around the middle. And so if we have all of them filled up, AX5, we have what's called trigonal bipyramidal, which is like, eh, low, a lot to say, but it looks like the classic shape. If one of those positions is just, instead of an atom, is a lone pair, it looks like a seesaw. Oh, looks like a seesaw. That's AX4E. Remember, we add up X, and E, that tells us how many electron groups we have. If we have two pairs of electron, two lone pairs of electrons, it kind of just looks like a T, right? This is a 90 degree angle. That's a 90 degree angle. You got a, you got a, a molecule that's sort of this T shaped. And if you have two atoms and three lone pairs of electrons, it takes a linear shape again. Because remember, the lone pair of electrons are really, really um, repel each other. And the greatest distance you can get between them is 120 degrees. So that's why they're 120 degrees apart from each other around the equator. Because if we put them at the top and the bottom, they'd only be 90 degrees away from something else. This is the way to get them as far apart from each other as they can. Okay. I'm going to wind up there. We'll finish this um, tomorrow. So any, any questions? Tonight you're going to be doing a lot of, a lot of this sort of thing. So it'll, it'll sink in. You're going to be drawing a lot of uh, diagrams. And the very first question refers to this, basically. Um, what's your central atom? How many electron regions are around it? How many atoms are there? How many lone pairs? What shape is it? So you can use this information um, to do those exercises. All right, everyone's head's hurting. But Any this questions? will not be in the first exam, yeah? Oh yeah, you need to know everything with this by, by, by tomorrow. No, yeah. this, is, this, is, this is chapter four, it's not gonna be on the test. <laughs> no, this is chapter four stuff. So in two weeks, we'll have another test. It'll be on that, it'll be then. Anything else? So when we will have the exam lab two? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Probably, yeah, probably three weeks. And then four weeks, there'll be a final. So yeah, we get, man, this goes by way too quick. I have a question on these 3D um, models. Mm. I'm sure. I'm not 
I'm not the best drawer. So no, neither am I. I suck. I can't make I can't make a stick man without it without tripping over my feet. So how how do we how do we write these down? Like sure, sure. I'll show you. Um, if we were drawing uh, methane, for instance, let's draw it right here. If we were drawing methane, so here with carbon in the middle, and we have one hydrogen coming there, one hydrogen coming there. If we want to make it look like one hydrogen's coming, whoa, whoa, one hydrogen's coming out at you, you make like a wedge like that. And you put, so that little wedge sort of makes it look like it's coming out. And then when you want something to look like it's going away from you, you make a little hatch mark like that. So that sort of gives you a three, three dimensional look that like it says, these two hydrogens are in the same plane. This, this one is coming out at you and that one's going away from you. But yeah, don't, don't get hung up and like, you know, you don't have to be a, a, an art star or anything. But okay. th this is the way we do it. If you want to have something coming towards you, you use a wedge. And if you want something going away from you, you use the hatch line. Yeah, it's a really good question. And when something has like, you know, six regions you want to look at, then it, it's darn near impossible to draw something like that. Okay, man, so everyone better shove something in their head because the uh, presentation's coming up. I will see you, half of you tomorrow afternoon. I'll see the rest of you tomorrow night. We'll finish this off and we'll start chapter five. I'm excited. You should be excited. For lab tomorrow, we're going to use the same uh, Java or different? Uh, no, I have something different up my sleeve for, for, for tomorrow. I'm still, I'm still um, um, getting back and forth with Dr. Gagreb about uh, what he wants, but I've got something arranged. I'll, I'll let him sort of tweak it a little bit if, if need be, and then we'll, we'll post it tomorrow morning. Okay. So. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. If we have mm -hmm. some questions regarding one of the labs, can we schedule an appointment with you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Send, yeah, send me an email. And if I can't answer it written because, you know, I, my writing is atrocious. Um, yeah, come to, come to office hours. If that doesn't work out, yeah, we can just set up uh, any time. Okay, thank you. Well, any reasonable time, you know. I don't want to get up before noon unless I absolutely have to. But I will if, if need be. Okay. All right. Have a good have a good very quick dinner and we'll talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. All right.